for today, we have Dr. Ruth Lati with our talk, uh, COVID-19 and miscarriage, what we need to know in reproductive medicine. Dr. Lati is a physician, PhD, professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Stanford University. Um, director of Muti Speciality Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Program at Stanford. Dr. Ruth, uh, it's our pleasure to have you with us here today. The floor is yours. Good morning. Can you guys see me and hear me? Yes. yes. All perfect. Okay, great. Great. Well, just want to echo uh, Dr. Simone and um, the entire team. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, such an unusual time for us to be getting together, an unusual topic. I think a few months ago we never could have imagined um, doing this right now, but um, tragedies have a way of bringing us together and really um, giving a, us an opportunity to connect on a different level. We can learn together, we can help each other, and um, these um, collaborative efforts really do um, highlight the strength of our community. So thank you all for being here today and really just joining me on this journey of learning about how COVID affects uh, reproductive medicine and our patients. So I'm not sure you see my screen, Juliet? We, yes, we see your screen, but you can, if you can put uh, in a slideshow uh, mode, yeah. Okay. Better. Okay. All right. Well, um, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, we'll be talking this morning a little bit about COVID-19 and miscarriage. Um, and as as was mentioned, I'm from Stanford. I wish I had a PhD. Um, and thank you for that flattery. But just just MD for for now. Maybe in the future, I'll I'll go get my PhD. Um, I really have no financial disclosures, but I did want to thank the entire iGenomics team, but in particular Sergio um, Cannabilis for um, helping me do the background and preparing the slides for this talk today. Um, so in the next 30 or 40 minutes, what are we going to uh, be talking about? So at first, let's review COVID-19 infections and review possible mechanisms of COVID um, and how it may affect early pregnancy and miscarriage. Uh, review the, the rapidly evolving literature around the evidence of COVID impacting pregnancy and miscarriage. And then hopefully together we can discuss um, future directions and um, hear from some of the participants about what their experience have been and what their questions are. Um, so first of all, just to want to give a little background about miscarriage, uh, something that we have to remember is that miscarriage is multifactorial. Um, all, it is the most common complication of early pregnancy, and just because we're in the middle of a pandemic doesn't mean we can forget about all the other things we learned about causes of miscarriage, primarily the fact that Early miscarriages, those that happen in the first trimester, are typically due to chromosome abnormalities in the embryo, uh, whereas later miscarriages are more often euploid and typically categorized as unexplained. Um, potential causes of unexplained miscarriage could be infection, immune changes, thrombosis, or other unknown genetic causes. Um, infectious and inflammatory etiology of miscarriage um, has been shown when we look at um, inflammation of the endometrium and a condition such as endometritis where the um, microbial environment of the endometrium is altered that has uh, been associated with failed implantation and miscarriage in several studies to date. And in one uh, pretty large review of infectious causes of pregnancy loss um, in human reproduction in 2015, they, they stated that approximately 15% of first trimester miscarriages and as high as 60% of second trimester miscarriage could be attributable to infection. Um, in addition to bacterial causes of um, miscarriage, there are also several viruses that have been associated with miscarriage and stillborn, um, namely parvovirus, Zika virus, CMV, rubella, H1N1, and others. So there is a pretty large historical precedent for a viral infection causing uh, pregnancy uh, complications as well as uh, stillbirth and uh, miscarriage. 
However, questions about COVID-19, placental infection, and fetal effects still remain as this uh, story is rapidly evolving in the literature. Um, uh, and not all viruses are associated with miscarriage. So I pulled this slide off the WHO um, website on May 1st. It may even be different today, just a few days later. Uh, but this is a worldwide pandemic. COVID is affecting um, virtually every country and continent in the world. And we're all facing these questions from our patients and our colleagues and um, scientific community. What is the impact of COVID infection on miscarriage? Um, so our world has changed since, since we learned about COVID in uh, December 2019. Over 3 million cases have been confirmed worldwide. Uh, many in our community here at Stanford have postulated that the true number is likely much larger. In fact, the seroprevalence in um, Santa Clara County, which is where Stanford University uh, resides, indicate that the seroprevalence of uh, COVID uh, antibodies is as high as 3%. And based on our population, that gives us about 80,000 cases in our county alone. Whereas last I checked, there were only a few thousand that had been documented. So um, as many as um, tenfold higher number of patients have been exposed than we really do know about. Uh, COVID infection is, as we are all hearing day after day, is highly contagious. And the reasons for this is um, inherent properties of the virus, but also the fact that when a new virus is introduced into our community, uh, virtually everyone is susceptible. There is, there is no immunity due to prior exposure. So one of the um, two of the factors that are leading to this rapid evolution is the fact that so many people are getting it so fast and very few of us are protected from it. Um, despite its widespread infection, uh, the presentation is highly variable. Uh, typical symptoms that we first heard about COVID causing flu, like symptoms, fever, cough, but um, as the pandemic evolves, we're noticing that GI symptoms, headache, fatigue, and loss of uh, smell and taste are becoming more and more um, common as the presenting symptom of COVID infection. When infected, women do appear to be less severely affected by the disease than men in terms of uh, case fatality rate as well as um, duration of hospitalization. Uh, and additionally, there are many patients who are infected with um, COVID virus, but are either minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. This is very different from other viral um, infections that we've studied in the past. So there's a lot of people wandering around not knowing they have this infection. Uh, the impact of this infection, whether it's asymptomatic, mild, or severe on pregnancy and miscarriage is still uh, largely unknown. Um, there's been an explosion of the literature and research on this topic. I've never experienced such a um, evolution of, of data in, the, in PubMed as I have with COVID. Every time I do a search on COVID and miscarriage or COVID and pregnancy, day after day, there are several more papers coming out. So um, our community is really trying to learn together about this and share their experience rapidly. Um, and then lastly, just the impact of shelter in place recommendations, both on our, um, our health in general, as well as the economic impact are largely unknown. And the um, emotional and psychological impacts of COVID are um, poorly understood. And we really won't be talking about that so much um, in this presentation, but it does seem to be um, a factor in uh, our, our population right now. How are we emotionally dealing with this pandemic? So the coronavirus family um, is basically, as we've all heard uh, the last several weeks, it's an enveloped RNA virus uh, that there are actually six types, but three have been um, responsible for um, large epidemics. Um, viral pneumonia with risks of developing systemic and multi-organ failure are um, what what really kills us with this with these viruses. They're typically spread by respiratory droplets. Um, SARS, as we 
um, learned was uh, had about 8,000 cases worldwide and presented with a case fatality rate of a little over 10%. MERS had fewer cases, but a higher case fatality rate. Um, and then now we're dealing with our third epidemic, which has now been named a pandemic of over 3 million cases um, with a case fatality rate that's much lower, but the impact is much higher because the total number of cases is higher. Um, WHO, as I mentioned, declared COVID as a global pandemic on March 11, 2020, and our lives have not been the same since. When was our last global pandemic? So in 2009, as many of you remember, um, we were dealing with H1N1. Uh, although it wasn't in the same family um, of coronavirus, it had some of the similar properties and why it became so widespread so quickly. Uh, because it was a new virus and there were there was very low um, immunity in the general population, it also grew very widely. Ultimately, by the time the pandemic kind of waned, we, we um, documented worldwide over 60 million people who um, had the H1N1 infection, um, and there were 12,000 deaths um, in the U.S. and over 150,000 deaths worldwide. So this, within you know, 2009, 2010, rapidly became the largest pandemic in at least my lifetime that I'd heard about. The difference between H1N1 and COVID-19 is that uh, there was a disparate impact on young patients with H1N1, with nearly 80% of the deaths being young patients. And as we all recall, who that this disease course amongst pregnant women was significantly more severe. So we were, um, when we were in dealing with this pandemic, we were all focused on why are these pregnant women ending up in the ICU and the literature, if we go back, I was just comparing to sort of, was there this same explosion of literature in um, 2009, 2010, like there is now with COVID and not so much. There were a lot of um, articles around the ICU course and, um, and the severity of the, on the maternal disease, but it actually took several years till the story about whether H1N1 caused miscarriage came out. Um, so starting in around 2013, we started to see this association between H1N1 and early miscarriage. Because uh, miscarriage is very um, common and as I mentioned, multifactorial, uh, trying to determine a, a cause and effect or at least an association with higher miscarriage rate really does require the use of sort of national health registry based cohort. So we see this is a really nice paper that um, came out of Norway actually just um, last month where they they looked at the impact of seasonal influenza as well as pandemic influenza namely H1N1 and the risks of pregnancy and fetal death uh, using a, a registration registry based cohort study uh, so they have an, a surveillance system for communicable diseases and they actually coded um, and tracked all in influenza like syndromes and compared uh, that to the the reporting of fetal deaths greater than 12 weeks uh, they they and many others have said the reports of um, miscarriage in the first trimester are going to be a little less commonly reported because they do not always occur in a hospital setting or even um, in a doctor's office. So they looked at both at, at the risk of fetal death in their population related to um, a diagnosis of influenza-like illness. And during um, normal flu seasons, there was no association between an influenza-like illness and fetal death. However, interestingly, in 20, uh, 2009 and 2010, during the H1N1 pandemic, the worst year of it, they did see an increased risk of fetal death associated with influenza-like illness that year in particular. So it's in contrast to other flu years that this particular virus was associated with an increased risk of fetal death. And they were also able to do a time course. So they had the strongest effect on um, fetal death 
if the influenza-like illness occurred in the first trimester and their hazard ratio was significant with a hazard ratio of 2.228. So this was a at least a time course the illness came before the um, pregnancy loss. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about COVID now. So when we talk about COVID virus, I think that we are often comparing it to SARS and MERS how, because it's in the same family. However, the sequence identity is only 80% with SARS and 50% with MERS. So we can't always assume that the effect of these two, these three viruses on the pregnancy and or, you know, the body in general are going to be the same. Um, COVID-19 um, um, has these spike proteins that we've all heard about probably that bind to your ACE inhibitors. And I think you can see my little, can't see what I'm pointing at, but um, that, um, that bind to the ACE inhibitor, but just binding to the ACE receptor, excuse me, um, is not enough for the virus to enter the cells. So this, the TM, PRSS2 is a um, protease that is required. It's a transmembrane protein that helps to digest the spike proteins and allows the virus to enter the cells. Once it enters the cell, it does seem to, in addition to um, beginning viral replication, it does seem to um, stimulate pro-inflammatory cytokines through the NF-kappa B um, and IL-6 pathways. Uh, additionally, as you see, and I can't have a pointer here. Oh, I, I don't know if you can see my pointers. When the SARS virus is attached to our ACE2 inhibitor, angiotensin 2 does build up because it's, um, the receptors are occupied. It builds up in the system, and angiotensin 2 does also cause vasoconstriction and stimulates um, a cytokine pathway in and of itself. So these are two mechanisms how um, this, the virus can stimulate this pro inflammatory uh, pathway. A lot of these diagrams and mechanisms are um, are theoretical at this point, but based on animal studies and other and our knowledge of the function of these um, uh, pathways. So um, next, the uh, I thought this was a really nice um, diagram here about um, how. Uh, cytokine storm can result from a viral sepsis. So Hugh Lee hypothesized that in a severe infection, the neutrophils and particularly the T cells become infected uh, by the virus, enter the bloodstream, cause cell death, and induce this um, increased um, fibrin mesh deposit again, vasoconstriction and activates the platelets, which is how we get a lot of our end organ damage. Um, and then also just as the viral particles lyse the um, um, lymphocytes, that's how one of the very common signs of more severe infections is lymphopenia, low white blood cell counts. So this, although it's a Primarily theoretical, this was this has been um, adopted as one of the main mechanisms of how you can get damage to a tissue without having direct infection of those organs. And specifically, the heart, kidney, and liver have all been um, um, documented to have damage to these organs, but no PCR um, viral particles have been documented in these organs. So this is how, even without documenting PCR positives, we're seeing uh, myocarditis, we're seeing uh, renal and liver failure. Uh, so what, what we're seeing in our early case reports, and I'll review these um, one by one in a moment, is that when we have a severe infection, that it's easy for us to imagine what um, that this infection could cause miscarriage. For example, when a woman is very sick, she has hypoxia, she's going to be on a ventilator, uh, the medications, the positioning, just the um, all those things that are associated with being in an ICU on a ventilator could put a woman at risk for miscarriage. Fever in many studies has been associated with um, um, placental injury as well as um, fetal demise. And as I mentioned, um, there are medications that are being used and introduced in the course of this pandemic 
um, without really knowing for sure their safety profile on pregnancy. Um, cytokine storm definitely could have an impact on early implantation and placental function. As we know, um, inflammation is a very delicate balance. It is actually many of these same factors are important in placental invasion, but there is a balance and a dose response that can lead to altered placentation. And then lastly, um, the hypercoagulable state. Um, uh, we have seen many other associations with hypercoagulation and miscarriage, such as antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, so this is a very real possible mechanism for um, causing miscarriage and placental um, infarction. Lastly, um, we need to keep on the lookout for evidence of direct infection of placenta and fetus with the virus. These studies are ongoing and I think um, still highly debated at this, at this time. So I want to take just two seconds to talk a little bit more about the hypercoagulable state because um, as we talk about uh, the virus and the course of disease being similar in pregnant women as age-matched women, I think that the one uh, thing we need to pay attention to is just the coagulation sim symptoms. So COVID-19 um, does uh, is associated with altered coagulation profiles, and there are several um, studies coming out confirming this, and in fact, anticoagulation um, is part of standard care in our hospital. Uh, the dose is unknown. How much does a patient need is unknown. Um, and you know how to individualize that dose, I think is very um, needs needs more for further study. There was a very interesting case series in New England Journal of Medicine, which was actually quite concerning to me about younger patients when their presenting symptom was ischemic stroke. So these patients were um, at home with mild symptoms or no symptoms, and their initial presentation was ischemic stroke. Uh, these patients, by and large, had altered coagulation pathways as the um, theoretical reason for these strokes. So in addition to hospitalized patients, it seems that there are a subset of patients out there in the community that are also experiencing evidence of hypercoagulation. Um, in these studies, and I've listed a few of them here, um, it is documented that with increasing severity of disease, we're getting hyperfibrinogenemia, high D-dimers, shorter clot formation time, as well as higher maximum clot um, firmness. So all of these things lead to uh, uh, the ability to form clots and not break them down efficiently. Um, what what most of these studies lack is any information on coagulation pathways and status in pregnant women. As we all know, pregnant women do have an increased risk of clot formation and that the coagulation system is additive. So the more risk factors you have, the worse your risk. So I do think that um, we need specific studies on coagulation and coagulation factors in our pregnant women who have mild, moderate, and severe symptoms to identify those who may benefit from early or more aggressive anticoagulation. Um, so we had a very nice review of the endometrium and COVID-19 last week through the same webinar. So I won't review the entire um, uh, topic today, but just to say endometrium is a very important part of early implantation and could contribute to miscarriage. So I think it's worth, worth reviewing today in our uh, discussion. Uh, endometrium um, as obviously part of the reproductive tract. We are seeing ACE receptors in the ovary, endometrium, and tro trophoblasts and testes. Uh, however, to date, we haven't seen COVID-proven PCR positive in the endometrium. We do know that the renin angiotensin pathway is active in endometrial um, decidualization and menstruation. Um, however, ACE2 receptors, although present, are relatively low in the non-pregnant endometrium. As we look at those studies further, the cell types that seem to be most um, expressing the ACE2 receptors are the um, epithelial cells, and it does seem to be cycle 
uh, phase specific. So we are seeing higher uh, expression of these receptors in the secretory phase. So this is a possible route of entry of the virus into the endometrium. Um, how about the, the maternal fetal interface? So once there is an embryo present, are there um, ACE receptors in the endometrium or in the maternal fetal interface? So this is a really nice study just published last month um, in uh, PLOS1, looking at uh, publicly available uh, data on um, you know, RNA sequencing in, relative, in um, tissue types. So they specifically mined the publicly available data specifically for ACE2 receptors and TMPRSS2 um, at the maternal um, fetal interface. And while ACE2 receptors were widely expressed in the maternal fetal interface in all the um, trophectoderm and cytotrophoblasts, um, ACE2 and TMPRSS2 to were co-expressed uh, only in the extravillous trophoblast, that is the invading trophoblast at the maternal fetal interface, the very forefront of it. And uh, interestingly, these two um, proteins were increasing expression with increasing gestational age. So just as a review, in order for the virus to enter the cell, it not only has to bind the ACE2, but it has to be digested by this protease so that the virus can enter the cells. So the most probable time of um, entry into the placenta would be through the extravillous trophoblast, um, and this risk potentially would be increased um, with um, increasing gestational age. This, although it doesn't prove vertical transmission, it is a um, site of potential vertical transmission or placental dysfunction. Uh, this is just a really basic science um, review of what's possible in the, in the uh, placenta, and the main purpose of this study was to just call for further studies on miscarriage and placental dysfunction. They weren't able to comment specifically on whether the virus was able to get in or not, but through this pathway it's possible. So let's shift gears um, and talk about clinical. So we've talked a little bit about theoretical ways that the virus could impact miscarriage, impact early pregnancy, but what are we actually seeing in our patients and what are the physicians and um, practices on the front lines seeing and reporting in the literature? So the first um, paper that we saw that addresses this question was this paper in um, AJOG. This paper was published March 25th and included all reports in the English literature up through March 13th. Um, they reviewed, um, included all reports of COVID virus epidemics, of the all three COVID virus. They included 19 studies which uh, covered 79 women and 41 of which had COVID-19. In the abstract conclusions, they, um, they reported that there was an elevated miscarriage risk of 39% and a 7% perinatal death, but in none of these 79 women was vertical transmission uh, reported or confirmed. This meta-analysis, actually, if we if we read a little bit deeper, to me at least, the abstract was a bit misleading uh, because they really did push and um, sort of combine all three um, SARS viruses in the same report. Um, important to note that this March analysis did include women the, in the, that were hospitalized in pregnancy. 90% of them had pneumonia. Um, as we all know, when we look at single case reports or ret retrospective series, that's always going to demonstrate sort of the sickest patients. Um, as uh, 79 women were included, 41 of which had COVID, 12 with MERS, and 26 with SARS. 26% uh, of the patients were in the ICU and 12% of the patients in this uh, meta-analysis actually expired. Uh, what we found when we compared the different uh, viruses was that the COVID-19 patients did have the lowest ICU admission rate at 9% 
and no, and no maternal deaths. Further dissecting out the miscarriage um, findings, we note that only two of the 19 studies included um, information about miscarriage, and both of these studies were um, SARS-1 only. None of the um, COVID papers commented on miscarriage, and there were no first or early second trimester cases in the patients in the papers described in the um, COVID-19 reports. So we really, although we found this um, higher risk of miscarriage in the um, sickest SARS patients, really cannot comment based on this data um, about COVID-19 reports. There was um, there were some perinatal deaths in this um, cohort, but the um, cause of that is unclear. So the limitations of this first report, um, and we have to give them credit for reporting what they, they have in a limited time, um, but um, it really only represents the maternal outcomes of our sickest patients. We really can't make any conclusions about mild cases um, and their impact on pregnancy outcome. We can't make any conclusions from this paper about early pregnancy exposure because the COVID-19 patients were late second trimester and beyond. Um, and um, as, as is appropriate, the authors recommended um, further study, but that this data needed to be frequently updated, meaning that as this um, pandemic evolves and is changing so rapidly, we need to keep talking and keep sharing our experiences. So fortunately, that call for further studies was answered by multiple uh, of our um, colleagues in the field. So that um, was late March. Um, the next case series that came out uh, came out about COVID-19 was in April 17th, 2020. And I've never actually listed such detail about the dates of papers before this talk. But um, the Chinese um, uh, experience on COVID-19 was again published in AJOG uh, by Yan Ji and colleagues. They reported um, 116 patients with COVID-19 pneumonia between January and March 24th of this year. There were, in this um, experience, no neonatal infections and no vertical transmissions. They did amniotic fluid and, neo and neonatal nasopharyngeal swabs on the vast majority of newborns. There were no deaths in this case series. Um, and they concluded that there was no increased risk of miscarriage in their abstract. So what did they make this conclusion on? They unfortunately did not have very many early pregnancy exposures. Only eight of their 116 patients presented in the first or second trimester, and there was only one miscarriage. So um, although they weren't able to document an increased risk of miscarriage, um, I would um, wonder if there were patients who might have miscarried that didn't make it into this case series. So um, the first report that came out said there was an elevated risk of miscarriage, which I think um, doesn't always, doesn't apply to all of our patients. And then the second one said there's no increase of miscarriage, but again, based on um, extremely limited numbers and um, timing of exposures. So next, not too long later, remember this one came out um, April 20, April 17th. The next paper we saw was just one week later, April 24th, um, and um, published a system, systematic review. This actually included 33 studies in, and did not limit to English language. Uh, they included all reports in the literature as of April 19th, so um, between you know, they somehow got a rapid turnaround from uh, April 19th to have it in the EPUB by April 24th. They did include um, 16 case series, 16 case reports, one case control study out of China. Um, there were a total of 385 women, and the gestational age at time of entry was six weeks to 41 weeks. So I was encouraged that they were able to enroll some women earlier. Um, unfortunately, the vast majority were um, at or beyond 24 weeks. Um, again, they in these in this case series, there was no evidence of transplacental transmission. 
Um, as I mentioned, the ages in this cohort, in this meta-analysis, were 21 to 42. Um, they included a high percentage of patients who were mild or asymptomatic. Uh, they, they recorded that the mild or asymptomatic patients were 95.6%. Um, severe um, infections were 3.6% and critical less than 1%. Um, I'm not a COVID expert, but they reported that these uh, this presentation breakdown was similar to age-matched non-pregnant female controls um, during that time. So high percentage of, um, of less symptomatic patients. They did report that there were two stillborns, stillborns in this uh, particular cohort, both occurring in critically ill women, one who eventually uh, died of the disease and then another one who was on ECMO at the time of the stillborn. Um, there was addition to the two stillborns, one neonatal death due to prematurity. Um, they did report um, that they had 109 patients who entered their cohort before 24 weeks um, and only three miscarriages. So whether the miscarriages um, um, occurred in the first or second trimester is unclear, uh, but um, it does seem to be a pretty low incidence possibly due to the fact that the vast majority of patients are entering these cohorts after the highest risk time for miscarriage. So the limitations of our current um, evidence is that we really don't have a systematic way to con collect early pregnancy outcomes. Um, there's no systematic way to collect asymptomatic carriers either. And given the fact that many people in our community are, are reluctant to, to go to a medical center out of fear of getting sick, um, a lot of patients are staying home um, and not being um, tested or documented. Additionally, um, with the exception of one study, we aren't really looking at much of a control group. So because miscarriage is very common, if we can't compare the miscarriage weight we're seeing to the miscarriage rate that we're expecting, we are, it's difficult to make any conclusion. Um, next, I do feel that there's um, a, a lack of follow-up just because the, the pandemic is so early. If somebody was exposed in their first trimester, she's probably only in her second trimester by now, so it might be hard to um, connect early exposures to later outcome just because we haven't had enough time to observe this virus yet. Um, there's a small number of miscarriages uh, and no tissue analysis, so we're not able to determine if these are truly unexplained miscarriages or not. Um, and to date, there's still no larger population-based studies available on COVID-19. That being said, I do feel that this um, case report that came out of um, Sweden, I've now forgotten, I can't believe that right now, Switzerland or Sweden, um, was in JAMA of April 20, um, 30th, so just a little over a week ago, does deserve to be discussed in this um, forum. So I'm going to go over this case report for those who haven't seen it, and then we can talk more about it after. Uh, there's a, they report, oh, Switzerland, there it is. A 28-year-old uh, woman pr with previously healthy presents at 19 weeks to her OB with uh, fever, cough, fatigues, and myalgia. Sim typical COVID symptoms. They did a nasopharyngeal swab, which was positive for COVID-19. They felt she was um, a good candidate for um, outpatient management. So they sent her home basically with supportive measures, fever, rest, uh, um, acetaminophen for fever, rest, fluids, and to come back if symptoms worsened. Two days later, she presented with the same symptoms and she had um, painful contractions and was noted to be um, have a cervical dilation of five centimeters. At the time of admission, she had fetal tachycardia and normal anatomy. The patient was given antibiotics and allowed to labor and deliver her a stillborn. After the um, pregnancy loss, the placental pathology showed 
mixed inflammation infiltrate of the placental funicitis and um, the pa placental pathology was gram stain, PCR for microbes, and cultured for bacteria, all of which were negative, no evidence of bacterial infection by any of these methods. They um, did RT-PCR on multiple tissues to try to get an understanding of um, where the virus was being expressed versus not. And um, as I mentioned, the nasopharyngeal swab on the mother, um, both at pr presentation, which was two weeks, two days, excuse me, prior to delivery and on her admission for delivery, her um, swabs were positive. They um, describe in this um, paper a very careful way of sort of um, anti, uh, of, of sort of cleaning the placenta um, and taking sp um, specific areas of maternal versus fetal side of the placenta to try to understand where the PC, where the infection was. So in the placental submembrane, both near the umbilical cord and in the cotyledons, um, those two um, areas of the placenta were positive for um, COVID-19 PCR. Um, however, amniotic fluid and membranes were negative for PCR. They additionally did vaginal swabs both at presentation and at delivery, um, which were negative for COVID. Maternal blood was negative. Am amniotic fluid, as I mentioned, was negative. Umbilical cord was negative and multiple swabs of the fetal mouth, armpit, anus, liver, and lungs were all negative for real-time PCR for COVID. So the only things that turned up positive for COVID were the nasopharyngeal swabs for the mother and the um, placental side, uh, the maternal side of the placenta. Fetal autopsy confirmed no fetal abnormalities. Um, fetal blood and tissue also was negative for bacteria, both by PCR and culture. So what does this, although this is a single case report, what does this case report tell us? Um, it does support that the viral um, particles can be detected within the placenta. Um, additionally, they were not able to document, despite the, um, you know, the maternal illness, any evidence of PCR in any um, of the fetal side of things. They claim that contamination of the placenta at the time of delivery is unlikely because of the vaginal PCR and maternal blood was negative. Um, and they, in their discussion, um, say that these findings are simpler, are similar to MERS, that the maternal side of the infection of the placenta um, being infected is uh, was common in MERS, and um, placental insufficiency, IUGR, and miscarriage was higher in the MERS um, studies where this was seen. Obviously, we need more studies, but um, to just say at this point that we can't, that the placenta is unaffected by the virus um, doesn't seem to be 100% true, as this case report does at least document for the first time that the placenta was infected or with the COVID virus. So after all this talking, can we make any conclusions about miscarriage and COVID? Uh, I still think that it's difficult to say given um, the data that we have has very few first trimester early exposures. Um, the stillborn cases that were initially um, reported did occur in very, very sick patients, which as we discussed, yes, the being sick could be the cause of the miscarriage, but maybe not the virus itself. It's hard to say for sure. However, this case report, the woman wasn't that sick. Um, she was well enough to be sent home, yet the placenta was um, appeared to be infected and she did have um, a 19 week pregnancy loss. Um, it's easy to say, but hard to do, We do that we need large-scale prospective studies to understand this better. And um, as much as I'd like to know right now what the impact of COVID on miscarriage is, I think the true impact will not be known for months to years. Um, the same way it took that much time for us to see the impact of H1N1 on miscarriage, I think it might take um, some time with COVID for us to really be able to um, understand this better. 
Um, and just, uh, you know, one thought that, that we're all somewhat comforted by the fact that COVID seems to be less severe and um, different than SARS and MERS. However, that doesn't mean there's no risk. And even a mildly elevated risk spread across millions of women could lead to a lot of excess um, uh, suffering and pregnancy losses. Uh, so as we start to think about we, the way that we as a community are going to study this and come to an, um, get some, some more data and answers, we have to keep in mind what the barriers are with miscarriage uh, research. So um, relying solely on hospital encounters is going to um, underreport miscarriages. A lot of miscarriages are happening at um, home without any any doctor visit or in association with an outpatient clinic uh, visit, which uh, may or may not be captured in um, some of our studies. Um, uh, miscarriage is multifactorial and miscarriages for many causes do seem to present in a similar way. So it's hard for us to look at the symptoms and say, oh, this miscarriage was due to a chromosome problem and this miscarriage was due to an infection um, without really um, getting more concrete data to differentiate um, common causes. Uh, the other thing that is, is tricky with miscarriage is there's often a delay in diagnosis. People don't know that they uh, they have embryonic or fetal arrest until days or weeks later. Um, so there's often a delay between demise and um, diagnosis. The same way there's a delay in COVID um, exposure, symptoms, and testing. So either of those could be delayed, which makes the um, sequence of events very difficult to track. Was the miscarriage happened before or after the COVID exposure? Um, the studies that we have to date, looking at hospital reports and looking at patient recall introduces significant biases to um, um, really only capture later or uh, more significant, more uh, advanced miscarriages and uh, the patients who are sicker with the COVID disease. So we'll have less, less information, less confidence about our um, early or mildly or asymptomatic exposures. Um, and then just lastly, studies linking prenatal or um, very early exposures in pregnancy to miscarriage or pregnancy outcomes that are happening uh, much later are rare, primarily because they're extremely difficult to perform. Um, we do need, it's funny how like my slides seem, I don't see the whole slide, I don't know if you do, um, a more systemic approach to capture as many exposed women as possible. Um, I would, sort of advocate for more routine testing or monitoring of asymptomatic patients to identify women who are exposed and not reporting or not experiencing severe symptoms. Um, to think carefully during this uh, time about adverse outcomes, even in the absence of COVID, to consider serologies or PCR for COVID because of the very high incidence of asymptomatic carriers of the virus. So we'll never know if a miscarriage happened in the setting of COVID if we're not looking for it. Registries are already um, started, and I think that as much as possible in our community, we should encourage our patients to participate. There's um, a UCSF um, study going on called Priority. Um, the website is listed there. And then I don't know if you can see it. It's cut off on my screen. Also, the um, website mothertobaby.org is um, including a, a registry of uh, you know, patient self-reports of COVID uh, registry, both for pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and uh, breastfeeding. So we can encourage our patients to participate in those studies to try to get a more longitudinal look at the impact of this uh, virus on pregnancy. So with that, I do want to thank you all for your attention. Um, encourage you to stay healthy, take some precautions, but maybe not as many as this individual in this um, picture here to um, stay safe and healthy. And, um, you know, let's keep talking. Uh, let's, I, hopefully we saved enough time for question and discussion, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, this okay, is Carlos. Carlos. <laughs> Apologies for my technical issues before. 
and thank you again for your very thoughtful presentation that uh, give us uh, exactly what we were expecting to learn more about you about the about this topic in in, in COVID-19 so thank you for for your kindness to take your time to prepare this sure. um, so I have uh, because we don't have uh, only have five minutes I have summarized you have many questions you have uh, five, 550 people following your presentation through the whole hour and uh, I have uh, three main topics that I would like you please to to let us know first is what about I mean you you are the 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 beacon on on miscarriage and and that's why our colleagues is asking for your opinion we are aware of the lack of data we are aware that we are at the beginning but uh, there is an urgent question that we have to ask I mean our patient is going to ask which is basically what is the risk of miscarriage in COVID-19 infection? So the thing is, can you please, knowing that this is difficult, um, do you think that there is a real risk for miscarriage? Learning from what we had in the previous pandemics and the learning about the, the case report that you have mentioned, even in asymptomatic patients, what would be your thoughts about that? So my thoughts versus what I know, I don't know anything at this point. I don't think any of us knows anything. Um, my understand, my reading of the literature is that um, women who get very sick likely will have a higher risk of miscarriage, primarily from these other pathways that we talked about, unless we learn how to treat um, the severe cases better. So I do think that there is a concern that if somebody is getting very sick, that that could affect her pregnancy. Um, the asymptomatic infections, I think we just don't know. If we don't have that um, cytokine storm or the increased thrombosis or any of, or hypoxia or fever, I don't know if it causes an increased risk of miscarriage. I think it could, but I just don't think we know. So. We need to try to learn more about it. Um, and at this time, we have to say, especially for early pregnancy loss and implantation, we don't know. We don't know. It could be, but we don't know. Thank you. What about terato teratogenicity? What is what you have read, what you know about that? Do we have any clue about the possible teratogenicity of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus? Nothing yet reported. Um, I, you know, I was kind of reflecting on some of our other pandemics like the uh, Zika infections and things like that, which did ultimately show to be uh, fetal toxic um, or teratogenic. It took us a long time to draw those conclusions um, between exposure and um, fetal uh, defects like that. Um, from what I see so far, no. I think it's encouraging that we haven't really seen fetal infections, that the placenta, something about the syncytial trophoblast is able to sort of um, um, prevent viral infection through the, to the fetal side is encouraging, but we don't know, we don't know. Okay, and finally, there is a, there is a, a bunch of questions about thromboprophylaxis in case of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 infection. Do you think, do you foresee any changes on the regular practice in terms of uh, heparin and the, and the, and the use of, uh, of anticoagulants in this type of infection? Um, you know, our Stanford, you know, I haven't seen any recommendations yet to change the dosage of thromboprophylaxis, although I think that we probably have a lower threshold and that's appropriate for um, pregnancy. Um, whether it needs to be a higher dose or not, I'm not sure. We don't even know what the dose in non-pregnant women should be. Uh, but at this point, I think we just need to follow the literature closely and um, you know, err on the side of treating as much um, you know, earlier and um, a little more aggressively in pregnant women, just taking into the fact that pregnancy is a, um, an additional risk factor. But there really aren't any guidelines yet. I think we should watch it closely. I, ho I hope we'll get something soon about some recommendations for pregnant women and that question, because it seems, seems to be concerning at this point. 
Okay, well, again, thank you very much. I think this is the time now. And, uh, and again, thank you to all participants and thank you for, for giving us this uh, this knowledge that we really need to to watch. Thank you for organizing it, Carlos. I really appreciate it. It's fun to look at everything and look look forward to meeting you guys all in person sometime soon. Likewise, and thank you all and and see you all next Thursday with the with the next presentation from Dr. Roberto Romero. Thank you so much. Okay, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.